as the associate occupier for sitting curriculum or artist occupier as I've been mistakenly naming myself so I use both namings now it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you all today um, to the Ignorant Art School sit in curriculum um, number two, the third class um, uh, with Ranjana Thapil Yal, um, a stillness class, the consciousness of doing. Um, and um, I advocate that actually this class should be um, open to uh, and rolled out among us nationwide, globally, um, uh, because I think the, the idea of the consciousness of doing is so prescient and so important. Ranjana will be um, giving a talk, um, followed by a workshop in which we'll all be um, putting theory into practice through a creative exercise in shifting perspectives. As I understand it, and uh, Ranjana can uh, correct me uh, as we go along, but I think we're talking about praxis and the synthesis of spiritual, um, uh, philosophic and pragmatic thinking into doing, uh, therefore into our lives. Um, but I'll find out. Um, this session invites participants to enter new territories of interdisciplinary, intercultural thinking in order to answer the brilliant question, um, which I'm not going to foreclose by trying to answer it because that's not the point, but I have got lots of thoughts, um, which is, um, can external revolution be effective while we remain internally unchanged? Uh, and I think we're to keep this provocation um, in our heads. Dr. Ranjana Thalpilyal is an Indian-born interdisciplinary artist and academic based in Scotland. Her practice spans ceramics, painting and ephemeral mixed media. Research areas include materiality in art, cultural and social identity and the metaphysical self in relation to all of these. Of particular interest are concepts of self in South Asian and West African traditions, feminist readings of ancient philosophies of the global South, cultural politics, and the development of decolonizing, interdisciplinary and intercultural strategies for art pedagogy and social environmental theory. In her book, and I think maybe Peter has put, oh, I've got the link here uh, for this, extraordinary sounding book i'm putting that in the chat and um yeah education as mutual translation a yoruba and ancient in indian interface for pedagogy in the creative arts which is 2018 um Thalpil Yao proposes an adaptive student-led pedagogy premised on critical aspects of yoruba and vedantic thought sensitive to history and student contexts and finally sorry i've taken up quite a bit of time introducing a um, brilliant uh, facilitator and um, writer uh, uh, but i just want to there it is peter's put it in the chat and you can all see for yourselves um uh, there's some uh, recommended books and thinking around bell hooks as well who um we're all um blessed to have spent some time on earth with um thank you ranjana uh, a pleasure. Thank you, Jade. Uh, it's, it's been lovely to meet you today, and I'm really looking forward to having some conversations about your work and, um, and your thoughts on the exhibition and seeing the shape of your occupation. It's going to be really very um, exciting for us, I think. Um, thank you also, Sophia, for setting up this wonderful project and for inviting me along and all the other fabulous workshops that are going to be taking place. Thank you so much. And Peter and Tanit for all the support that you've been giving me. Uh, in, in getting this going and hopefully we'll all get it all together tonight and everything will go smoothly. Um, I'm the, yes, as Jade has explained, the format is I will give a, a talk because I think it's quite important to get the grounding of what we're going to experiment with. Um, and I suppose what I can say in a nutshell is that there, there's going to be quite a lot of theory and these four different schools of thought will be discussed in the in this little mini lecture. Um, but we're going to take that a kind of a baby step in the, in the workshop in terms of if we're talking about the overall idea between these, these theories is that there is a kind of unity that underlies all things. 
And ideally that should help us to deal with a person who we totally disagree with. But the last thing you want to do when you really are hating what somebody is saying or doing is to think I am one with this person. <laughs> So I thought, could we do this in a, in a sort of step-by-step -step way by, by first just shifting perception with things that are a little bit more palatable or and they still stretch our imagination. So we'll come to that in the second half. But right now, I'll just go straight into um, setting up our background. So the consciousness of doing. Over the past few years, I've been thinking a lot about the Hindu concept of karma yoga, unattached action, and vivek, which is discernment. The question of self-aware action seems especially important in today's complicated world of magnified opinions. As we know too well in the digital era, every passing thought and flickering mood can acquire the same presence as the most assiduously researched, diligently argued theory. There must seem to be, uh, there doesn't seem to be any need even to manipulate the truth because it seems too easy just to establish a new one for any purpose. Especially disturbing are examples all over the world of movements towards egalitarian societies being first discredited, then hijacked by far-right actors who proceed to use the same language as the campaigners to accuse progressive causes of discrimination and divisiveness. Similarly, in debates about democracy, we see a blurring of freedom and extreme individualism, usually working in favor of private profit at very high levels. Knowing what to do, how to react, never seems never seem to be as hard as it does today. So how do we find meaning in clashing voices that all claim our allegiance, all maintain that they show things as they really are? Increasingly, it seems to me that the answers cannot simply be found in making a better argument. There is a more fun foundational shift that needs to take place. The issues that need to be addressed are outside of us, but a desire for the social good carries the seed of a deeper question. Where does I begin and we end and vice versa? Can recognition of common origins beyond our individual identities bring about social change or equip us to stem the influence of harmful ideologies? One of the most interesting things about these questions is just how long they've been around and how the concept of a metaphysical self beyond the ordinary person we know ourselves as has always intrigued humanity. For years now, I've been researching what Jade mentioned, the overlaps in concepts of self and functions of mind in Yoruba philosophy from West Africa and Advaita Vedanta from South Asia. Both are ancient and perennial at the same time. More recently, I began looking at materialism, a philosophy of social science developed by Roy Basker in the 20th century in the UK. And then in the autumn of 2020, I received an invitation from artist Wassily Widmer to write a theoretical text for an artist book he and Daryl Schlitnick were putting together. The text was to accompany a publication of artworks produced by artist friends separated by pandemic lockdown, keeping their scattered community together through creative practice. It prompted me to work my way through ideas that had been brewing for some time, and it led, somehow, led me somehow to reflect again on another influence from my upbringing, J. Krishnamurti. It struck me then with great force that the one thing all four worldviews had in common was the idea of unity without distinction. Sorry, unity within distinction. And also that in what I describe as the enormous pause of 2020, many people had sensed for the first time a commonality of, if nothing else, of human fragility. I wrote at the time, many have discerned a hum, Pascar's ground state, Vedanta's consciousness, a unity that underpins us all. It seemed that stillness had instilled humility and that it held the potential for returning not to the same, but to a rebuilt and better world. And despite the squandering of time by governments, there were and still remain signs that people can forge change. This is the second iteration of those ruminations, this time with the practical articulation too. 
I'm inviting you to share my exploration and to bring your own insights into how these philosophical ideas can or perhaps cannot be applied to crucial questions today. These are lifelong areas of study and today's session offers a tiny, tiny glimpse. But I've always said, when you're not sure where to start, it's a good idea to start somewhere. And to quote Bell Hooks, who we've sadly lost so recently, when we create a world where there is union between theory and practice, we can freely engage with ideas. Hooks was clear also about the practical and existential benefits of seeking to know and understand fully, stating that it had given her a way to create whole pictures in my mind's eye, pictures that were not simply formed through reaction to circumstances beyond my control. So understanding theory can help us to grasp the things that are happening in the everyday and feel a little bit more capable of, of um, having impact on them. Hooks felt theory when applied to real life situations empowers through understanding and through critical formation of appropriate response. In this spirit, let me first share what I've understood so far. And in the workshop after the talk, we can put some of it to the test. The philosophies of Advaita Vedanta, Bhaskar's meta-realism, which extends but deviates from critical realism, Yoruba cosmology and J. Krishnamurti's iconoclastic first and last revolution all speak in their particular ways of a reality with a capital R, which is present in all beings and all matter, a common immaterial fabric that connects everything and everyone. The idea is that once this reality is perceived, our perspective on the ordinary world shifts. Each of them also places significance, either overtly or by implication, on the role of critical thought in determining right action. So basically, this, this rock, and I, and you, and the computer, and time itself are all composed of the same thing. Not much resemblance, but it's all the same thing. To imagine a reality that exists beyond the purely physical, quantifiable world, and yet exists in every atom, is to move outside of empirical experience to a more foundational state of being. So for those who may be unfamiliar, I've, I've uh, put in the first slides of my PowerPoint are some pared down definitions of terms that are going to be coming up as we go on today. So let me share my screen. If we'd start from the perspective of Western philosophy, there are four core fields or disciplines. There is ontology, the study of beings or their being, which has to do with what is, what simply is. Epistemology, the study of knowledge, how, how we know. Logic, the study of valid reasoning, how to reason. Ethics, the study of right and wrong, how we should act. The study of beings or their being, the what is of ontology, uh, has to do with the science of being as such and the causes of things. It's concerned with the nature of the universe, the phenomena of existence met and, and metaphysics. Metaphysics is notoriously difficult to precisely uh, define. It's debatable and debates continue. And concepts and concerns associated with it have changed, especially since the 17th century. But as used in this talk, it's quite important for me to say that I'm using the word meta metaphysical self in the sense not of a specific branch of philosophy, but referring to a concept of the self that exists beyond our everyday perceptions, perceptions of time, space, and identification. Something that moves beyond you know, me, my name, my, my family, my, my job, et cetera. So, uh, that's kind of establishing the, some words that will keep coming up. The philosophies that we're looking at today suggest that we have an ontological self and that its source, the composition is one and the, the composition are one and the same as the ontological source of all phenomena. 
that source or causal factor can we can be can be referred to as the real with a capital R as mentioned before. But if the real is not our world, if the real is not the reality of the everyday world, what is it? To Vedantis, the ordinary world is impermanent, illusory, known as samsara or maya. To materialists, it is the imperfect sociological and political world we have created with its destructive systems and structures. To the Yoruba, the mortal world is but one of three cosmic spheres, all three of which require critically conscious balancing to maintain harmony in each. To J. Krishnamurti, who rejected all organized religions, schools of philosophy, and book learning, it is the seat of desire, but also the spark of critical self-reflection leading to self-evident truth. These philosophies are not usually spoken of together, and you may already see contradictions between them even in this one paragraph. This is to be expected in any comparative discourse. However, there are many intersections and the striking commonality of an underlying reality that constitutes but is invisible to the physical world invites particular exploration. Haskar's philosophy of meta-reality highlights the practical benefits of recognizing a causal ground state. This ground state underpins not only ourselves as persons, but also by making them possible, our social structures, both just and unjust. Due to the epistemic fallacy or perception that knowledge can be only be said to exist on what can be observed and empirically proven, humanity takes its own subjectivity to be entirely independent of objects. That is, we see ourselves as subjects and others and everything else as objects. This leads us to perceive existence and the world as dualist in essence and construction. It also inclines us to an anthropocentric relation to the world. Thus, our structures, systems, and mechanisms that operate them are so often out of kilter with nature. Pascal proposes that they are also out of kilter with our own true nature, which is the ground state, in which all elements of the universe are equally present and equally important. He suggests that a non-binary, non-dualist understanding of ourselves and other phenomena is a more conducive and more accurate perception of being and existence. Rather than focusing solely on that which can be seen and touched, we must learn to discern the ground state that gives us broader perspective. At the same time, reduction of all knowledge claims to questions of ontological being creates the onetic fallacy, because it cannot be assumed that the real can simply be intuited. Indeed, the stance of critical realism the precursor to materialism suggests that it is necessary to work with both ontological and empirical domains. And my observation so thus far is that, that Eastern philosophies tend to do this by nature, that they are working with both systems. After all, we perceive through our senses, <clears throat> we perceive through our senses, we think through our minds. What we perceive, however, is limited to superficial, constructed, structural phenomena. When we factor in the concept of ontological presence, we are able to envisage the real causal domain that underpins everything. So Vasco contends that everything is emanating from this real, this capital R real, the ground state. Moving further towards transcendental thought, Vasco asserts that the ground state is a free, loving, creative, intelligent energy and activity. It is the undivided or non-dualist source and powerhouse of our dualist world. Recognizing it is both plausible and vital since realization opens up the possibility of visioning and creating a balanced world, a society in which the free development and flourishing of each unique human being is understood to be the condition as it is also the consequence of the free development of the flourishing of all. It's such a beautiful thought. 
So meta-reality takes the social sciences several steps further along the ontological shift of critical realism, but it maintains a focus on the practical social benefits of keeping our attention on causation and not purely on effect. So what he's saying is in our, in our little s self lives, um, we are only seeing the structures, we are seeing what we've created, we've seen what's emanated, and we are, it is all underpinned by the, the ground state, but it isn't the real, it isn't our true nature, it isn't the nature of the ground state, which is a, a generous and wouldn't, if we, if we understood it, we wouldn't be creating the corruption that we do, basically, the, the problems that we create for ourselves. So in other words, critical realism and meta-realism, both theories are concerned with the hows and whys of social phenomena beyond the positivist measuring and analyzing of outcomes alone. The difference lies in the incorporation in meta-realism of ideas that staunch critical realists would consider to be too esoteric. In his own words, Pascal confirms and represents in a radical new way, apt for contemporary times, um, thought systems regarded as purely philosophical or spiritual, including Advaita Vedanta, Yoga, Sufism, the Kabbal, Zen, and Taoism. At this point, Bhaskar comes to emphasize the importance of personal transcendental identification. Recognizing the ground state leads us to see that it also exists in everything and everyone around us, and therefore to acquire co-presence with it. The effect of co-presence is the possibility of activity conceptualized with ground state or real awareness. In other words, such awareness enhances our ability to discern right action and to enact the ground state qualities of human beings, including creativity, love, capacity for right action, and for fulfillment of our intentionality in this world. Despite skepticism among many critical realists about Bhaskar's perceived spiritual turn, Hartwig Sayers and others have further developed meta-realist directions. Margaret Archer, who was also pivotal in the development of critical realist theory, especially in sociology, has explored the application of its principles to religious experience and to notions of God. The most significant implication of meta-realism for us today is that re is recognizing is that it states that recognizing the oneness of our own being with all other beings is a prerequisite to imagining and creating societies that are just and in harmony with nature. And therefore, that personal fulfillment is codependent on the well being and prospering of others. Mutuality of the kind envisaged by Bhaskar is recognized in African philosophies too and encoded into religious practices. In Yoruba thought, an expectation of both reciprocity and criticality is further exemplified by its perceptions of civic governance and education. OK points to a critique of power and the role of citizens in ensuring that it is not abused. He analyzes tenure ethics or expectations of behavior that shape and shape the conduct and determine the suitability of those in key positions in traditional Yoruba masquerades. In ceremonies involving masked performers invoking particular deities, praise poems about the deity that is being celebrated are sung, but encoded within them are messages to the performers. These convey expectations of self-criticality and reminders of the limits and boundaries of their temporarily assigned status as intermediaries between spiritual and mortal worlds. So there's a recognition that, they, they, that uh, if you are chosen uh, to represent the spiritual world in a ceremony, you must at the same time remember that you have your mortal limitations. You have a responsibility to behave in correct ways. And if you don't, then it's going to still be part, you know, it's just something you're going to have to face up to later on in regular life. So there's this very uh, interesting slippage between the spiritual and, and the practical and, and the mundane, if you like. Sriyanka and Pemberton describe how such ethical awareness is an expectation of holders of all religious or civic positions of power, 
the message that leaders and followers alike must remain aware of multiple allegiances to family, community, spiritual and natural worlds, and find balance between them is constantly reinforced. Delivered as subtext, visual metaphor through linguistic slippage and humor. Similarly, Fayemi and Makole Adelure demonstrate that highly nuanced Yoruba vocabulary on education is a rich source of inspiration and practical application to contemporary times. Most tellingly, in Yoruba education discourse, the accumulation of facts is differentiated from wisdom because the definition of wisdom includes an ability to interact with others in meaningful ways constructive of social cohesion. This correlation of good leadership and self-knowledge pre predating meta-realism by thousands of years seems to underline a possibility of civic good coming from self-awareness. It is further visible in the Yoruba conceptualization of mind. Abimbole explains that the Yoruba concept of personhood as, is composed of two parts. The physical material body, Ara, and a metaphysical soul complex divided into Emi, Ori, Ashe. Of these, Ori, or inner head, is the principle of material actualization. The Ori's temperament, and therefore the actions it is likely to instigate, are determined by the, by the Ori or essential nature of a particular deity. It is therefore important to ascertain which deity an individual is aligned with, and there are ceremonies to determine when a child reaches a certain age, which God is, is going to be the most influential factor. Seen in another way, the concept of Ori as determinant of materialized intent is a precursor to psychological analysis of individual and his or her actions, an individual and his or her actions. The inner head, as governed by the temperament of a particular god, can be understood as a self composed of subconscious and conscious memory. Likewise, the injunction to identify which deity governs a particular individual can be understood as a method of inducing reflective awareness of one's tendencies and potentials, positive and negative. What is modern therapy, after all, if not a coming to terms with the cause, causes of one's actions and endeavoring to change them if they have become harmful to oneself or to others? It is notable also that in Yoruba thought, the influences of the inner head are inclinations and do not constitute an inevitable destiny. So this sense of agency is there all along, that you need to work it out because then you can watch out for these, in, these negative inclinations and maybe try and develop the more positive ones. There is agency in dealing with the Ori. Knowing one's influencing Orissa well through mythological narratives and considering inherent dangers in both their strengths and weaknesses are also said to constitute wisdom. So again, we have this sense that mythology, religion, philosophy, all of these things are working together, psychology are all working together. And this is something that we don't have time to go into, but I think it's very important to remember that one of the reasons we don't hear very much about some of this subject matter in the Northern Academy is because there's a tendency to separate all those subjects. And, and there's a great fear of it in talking about religion, for example, in your in art school, or you know, and, the, and there might be good reasons for doing that. But it's very difficult to approach African and, and South Asian philosophy without being able to see how these things interact. Okay, so the imperative of, of acting of actively choosing appropriate conduct also conveys an understanding that mistakes will be made, that people and gods are fallible, and that with critical judgment, the situation can be righted again. And this comes up very much so in Advaita Vedanta. In Advaita Vedanta, or non-dualist Vedanta, because there is a dualist Vedanta, but we're not going to be splitting those kinds of hairs in, this, in, in today's session, there is a presumption that the body and mind with which we identify and by which those around us know us is a temporary phase in a long journey. It is one of the many forms that the itinerant Jeev Atman soul takes until it comes to realize through trial and error, joys and sorrows, and many lives, that this endless cycle of rebirths simply cloaks a timeless state of being. 
The Jeev Atman is the divided self identifying with the limited perceptions of its temporary existence in an illusory world. Conditioned by ignorance of its true nature, the Jeev Atman takes the experience of emotions and physicality to be its only reality. In Advaita Vedanta, true reality, the eternal nature of all living things is physically imperceptible beyond all the identifications of the relative world. And like Bhaskara's ground state, it is the essential nature of all things. In Advaita Vedanta, however, there is a link with reincarnation, which there is not in Metarealism. When recognition of causal reality occurs, identification with the relative world is seen to be false. There is no longer any need for rebirth since the liberated Jivatman achieves a non-dualist state, becoming one with reality, which is given the names Atman, Brahman, or pure consciousness, consciousness with a capital C, which is not the consciousness of where, where we faint or, or we are aware of what's going on. It's a consciousness which is like the ground state. It is a, a, a state of being. It is a being. It is being itself. one could say. One could argue that this thought system resides wholly in mystical realms. It seems unlikely to be useful in addressing practical questions today. That is until we examine the theory of karma yoga or the yoga of unattached action. The apparent simplicity of the advice that emerges from an understanding of action in Vedantic thought is matched only by its degree of challenge and the unflinching honesty required to practice it effectively. Doing and not doing, choosing right from wrong, interfering or turning away, Vedanta suggests that these very actions and decisions about them can constitute routes to self-realization, but only if they are carried out without overemphasizing the doer. The Jeevatman is the doer, and Atman simply is. Here's the difficult bit. An action carried out for the sake of reward, as in praise or self-interest of any kind, even if beneficial to the other, does not contribute to realization of consciousness. This does not refer to fair payment for one's labor, but to the desire to use the act as a way of enhancing personal status, be it social or spiritual. Alas, quite apart from the obviously flawed builder of temples who employs enslaved labor, even fair actions of great benefit to others or bringing succor to the suffering fail to help self-realization if done with that specific aim in mind. So if I'm thinking, yeah, I'll be very realized, I'll help everyone and then I'll get enlightened, not gonna work. It's a really tough thing to actually do, simple but tough. Vedantic discourse offers other routes to self-knowledge too, such as intellectual study, devotion or renunciation, the root of unattached work. Karma yoga is perhaps the most available and yet most difficult. The key here apparently is to do the thing that needs to be done, work for work's sake, being equally untouched by praise or criticism for it. The effect of such action is twofold. By shifting the focus from ego satisfaction to the job itself, there is an enhancement of the ability to perceive the individuated self as a container of a greater self, reality, or consciousness. It enhances our ability to see that. Equally significantly, since this perception also reinforces commonality with all other beings, action in relation to them becomes more critically and ethically appropriate. So on closer examination, an apparently esoteric concept has direct bearing on our behavior in the concrete present, in this material world. Fellow beings, the natural world, our actions all become reminders of a non-dualistic state. Meta-realism speaks to this same realization and its ensuing possibilities for the common good, particularly in Pascal's discussion of right action. But what of the human tendency to convert belief into antagonism towards those who do not share it? or to create social systems supposedly reflective of wisdom and care, but in fact stagnating in outdated interpretation? What of refusals to identify and question corrupt or flawed aspects of religion and social structures? A rise in religious fundamentalism in all major faiths is evident across the world. 
in this context, a close look at both Yoruba and Vedantic thought suggests that critical situatedness and empowerment to select, evolve, and debate ethical contemporary applications of its principles are logical extensions of both. The answers are within the theory. They're not meant to be followed uh, in a stagnant kind of way. They are, they are dynamic ways of being. In Vedanta, the Sanskrit term vivek is used uh, to suggest that we have agency demonstrated by our powers of discrimination, not in the sense of prejudice, but as the ability to differentiate, to analyze. There is a strong tradition of rigorous debate, dialogue, and disagreement in Vedanta, applying to the analytic, and applying the analytical eye of Vivek and the principles of karma yoga should also energize recognition and removal of destructive aspects of interpretations within the broad body of Hindu thought. The caste system and the outrageous inequalities it perpetuates and the supremacist tendencies of the Hindutva movement come urgently to mind. In Yoruba philosophy, the deeply reciprocal understanding of self in relation to society, critical self-awareness, and imperative of holding power with humility offer similar possibilities. A thought system predicated on such principles of mutuality and holistic awareness can also enable critical re-evaluation re of its applications in religious, social, and political spaces, and also enable the identification of stultification and corruptions. Its emphasis on education and wisdom as ongoing processes, self-reflection as generative of appropriate behavior towards others, its paralleling of cyclical mortal, spiritual, and natural worlds can illuminate many current dilemmas. So I've referred to several different the, the, the three schools we've spoken about so far together there, but I think you can um, pick out the specific things that apply, but in general, there's a message that one can find within them a way to stop them from stagnating. Nevertheless, any label can become a barrier, and it can be said that any identity potentially closes minds to others. For J. Krishnamurti, there is only one revolutionary act. He's, he, uh, he says, when the mind is still, not made still by discipline, by control, by greed, to experience something which is not of the mind, when the mind is really still, then you will find that there comes a state which brings a revolution in our outlook, in our attitude. This revolution is not brought about by the mind, but by something else. He insists that all attempts to improve ourselves with the dependent, when de to improve ourselves when dependent on doctrines, teachings, religions are essentially doomed, because our very attempt at following, reducing, at following reduces the aim to a repetition of ideas, and the ideas we follow, as well as the aim of following, are products of mind, of asserting the individual sense of I, which causes strife in the first place. So Krishnamurti is completely saying, don't read the books. He, in fact, he was known to say, don't read my books. He used to say that, that the minute you start to follow, your, your mind is, is taking you back to your conditioned understanding of what already, um, and, and, and those conditioned understandings are what's leading you to ask these questions. So why are you still working with those conditions? You need to do something more direct, more, more fresh. To improve society, therefore, to prevent wars and divisions of all kinds, requires individuals to move beyond the limitations of mind and accumulated knowledge. This requires looking beyond, the immediate, beyond immediate thoughts, a stillness of mind brought about by rigorous but unjudgmental questions of the workings of thought and desires. This means that we must be willing to strip ourselves of everything we find, of every, sorry, I'm gonna say that again. This means that we must be willing to strip ourselves of everything to find the other state. And when once we have even a slight glimmering of the other, which is not of the mind, then the state, then that state will operate. That is the only revolution. In other words, the first and last step to personal and social liberation is the individual's decision to live harmoniously. 
This, Krishnamurti says, does not preclude advocating for or fighting for social or political change, but prevents the delusion that outward change alone can make a difference in society. Emphasized throughout his commentaries is the tool of acute and ongoing observation. Scrutiny of one's own motives soon reveals how conditioned by past assumptions, fears, and beliefs of our thoughts uh, our thoughts are, whether in expressions of love, desire to do good, attitudes to death, and to life in general. This revelation brings the act of striving to an end and instead allows the individual to become the change that they seek. Instead of rushing about to do good, Krishnamurti suggests an inner change makes ethical, unselfish judgment and action more possible because inner transformation guides it. On education, Krishnamurti's ideas open new horizons. The teacher ceases to deposit knowledge, but opens the student's eyes to both beauty and ugliness, and to the ability to observe themselves, to act in reflective ways. In short, to understand the interplay of what he calls education and the significance of life. There is much criticism of Krishnamurti for not offering tangible instruction that can be followed or passed on. This, in fact, is the basis of his practice, and it places the onus on and within the person who is seeking to change of any kind. An analytical criticism is that the decision to observe the mind and to speak, seek to go beyond it is also an intellectual decision of the very mind that is presented to be the trap. There is nonetheless an undeniably perennial and refreshing message in his talks and texts. We each hold the key to change, daunting as it may be, Rather than endlessly sifting through others' interpretations of life, ethics, and the self, we can get on with constructing a better, more vividly aware present. Emerging in different landscapes and eras, Advaita Vedanta, Yoruba thought, Krishnamurti's iconoclasm, and the ongoing project of materialism are challenging, complicated to work through, but also offer hope. They suggest a person has ontological dimensions that can shape cultural and political action. By looking through a lens that reveals our connected selves and enhancing our abilities of discernment, we can find a way through the jungle of opinions and manipulations we navigate every day. When we strongly disagree with someone, the last thing we might want to do is to accept an ontological sameness or co-presence with them. But being in the habit of doing so might just give us the distance to tackle hate speech or challenge misinformation in an effective way. Um, and, and lots to read. So we will, well, I will send out my sources, my, the, the references for this talk, and maybe a few other links uh, for anyone who'd like to go into them. And I would suggest if anything has really piqued your interest, do read more into it. There's so much, so much one could go on and on. Um, but I think I've gone on quite long already. So um, a very quick introduction to the workshop, but Tanith will kindly lead us into the portfolio of images. But what I'm asking you to do is to select one file, one image, or one sound file, or one video. You can use the whole of it, or you can use a section of it. And you're going to uh, describe in some way, or try and, try and sense what is the being of that other thing if it's a pigeon, if it's a piece of bark, if it's um, whatever it is, if it's the sound of the waterfall or it's, or it's the visual of the waterfall, what, what kind of movement is going on, what's happening? So that, as I was saying, this is, because we can't, it's hard to jump straight to want to suddenly trying to be, feel at one with someone you totally disagree with. Can we do this? Can our mind, can our heart, can our openness help us to experience the being of another? So Tanith will, will run you through the images in one go, and then you'll have access to them. Maybe Tanith, I'll let you explain that um, so that I don't muddle it up. And one thing I was also going to say is that there's also a document on there with some prompts to help you um, ease your way into the exercise if you're really not, not knowing where to start. Okay, so I'll leave hand over to you, Tanith. Absolutely. So those uh, images are playing just as we go through at the moment. Uh, they're also in a document with which Peter has put into the Zoom chat for us at the moment, which you can download. Um, 
and yeah if you have any problems just let us know if you're having any issues with downloading those and just one thing i'm going to say is that because uh we got a little late and we didn't do questions and answers perhaps we could do 20 minutes on the exercise and then um we could combine questions with some feedback to what how you felt about doing the exercise yeah that sounds great me and peter just uh had the exact same thoughts as well there <laughs> And Tanit, you need to tell them about the Padlet. Yeah, so I'm just aware that we're about to go into um, files that display some audio, so I'll go over the Padlet in just a moment. Um, once the um, upcoming videos and audio pieces have played, because we have these, uh, there's 38 images uh, prompts, and then there's three videos and three audios. Um, which are all available in the same document and as Ranjana said she's encouraging you all to choose one to respond to. So the Padlet it link is in the chat at the moment. If um, once these videos, uh, these um, prompts have run through, you want to open that up and have a look. That's a space where you can um, all respond individually. There's the opportunity to upload a file. You can record audio directly into Padlet. You can draw directly in. Uh, you can record video. You can do whatever, um, whatever sort of response you feel like I'm just going to be quiet so these videos can play. 